Thank you. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to talk about fibrosis in COVID-19. So over the next 40 to 45 minutes or so, I'm going to give you an overview of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which is the disease that I'm most interested in, and then give you some uh, a little bit of a, a, a information about COVID-19, although most of you will know most of this, and then describe some of the shared mechanisms of disease before describing the potential impacts of COVID-19 on IPF, and then the consequences, the long-term pulmonary consequences uh, of COVID-19. So idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is a disease of older people. Uh, it has a predilection for, for elderly males. It usually presents with a two to three year history of progressive shortness of breath on exertion, and a dry, non-productive cough. And it's commonly associated with being an ex-smoker. And the smoking history is often distant, so 20, 30 years past, rather than a, a recent smoking history, uh, which gives us some idea of the latency for, for fibrosis. And also building and manual trades, particularly wood dust and metal dust workers, uh, obviously asbestos leads to a, a a disease very similar to uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. There's also a strong genetic component. We know that there's about 20% of patients with sporadic IPF have a, have, have a, a family history. Um, and there are genes, which I will talk about, that have been associated with the development of pulmonary fibrosis. So age and sex are, are important in the development of fibrosis. But also, and this is really crucial when we think about COVID, our comorbidities. 50% of patients with IPF will have hypertension. A third of patients with IPF will have type 2 diabetes. And a large number of patients have ischemic heart disease. And in fact, ischemic heart disease is a common cause of death in patients with pulmonary fibrosis. So these are really important comorbidities, and we'll see why. And over the years, I've collaborated uh, with Louise Wayne, a genetic epidemiologist from Leicester, and we've done a, a number of GWAS studies now, uh, looking at genes which might be causally linked to IPF. And in the context of COVID and what this might mean for the longer term consequences of COVID, I'd like to draw your attention to uh, three. Um, there we go. So DPP9, ACAP13, and ATP11A. Uh, and the, these are all important uh, as, as causal variants, but I'd also like to draw your attention to MUC5B because that's interesting uh, also, and I'll talk about that in relation to COVID, but it's the biggest genetic risk factor for IPF uh, and has the biggest effect size and is, uh, is also fairly common. So IPF occurs as a result of alveolar injury, and this is a normal alveolus. You can see here this massive trichrome, beautiful structure, very delicate. Uh, this is the alveolus, this is the endothelial uh, vessel, and this is the, uh, the interstitial matrix, which sticks all the stuff together. And this cartoon shows the key anatomical features. So you have a small airway epithelium, you then have type 1 and type 2 epithelial cells, they sit on a basement membrane where the alveolus comes into contact with the capillary. This basement membrane is shared, and this is really important. Uh, and this, the, the, the interstitial matrix is synthesized by the fibroblast, and host defense is mediated primarily by the alveolar macrophage and the interstitial dendritic cell. And it's very easily damaged, this structure. It's damaged by things like uh, oxygen free radicals, inhaled dust, as we've described. And we've known for a while that viruses uh, could cause alveolar damage, particularly influenza, and now obviously COVID, and also immune-mediated injury. And all these things can damage the alveolus. And when the alveolus is damaged and doesn't repair properly, this happens, and this is fibrosis. And you can see that the, the delicate structure is completely obliterated. I mean, the gas exchange is gonna have a hard time occurring during this thick, dense collagen and fibronectin matrix. And again, you can see in this cartoon here, the, the key features, 
So there is bronchialization of the, uh, of, of the alveolar epithelium uh, with the, the development of uh, type, uh, type, uh, type two cells, which are lost in transition to type one. So they try and, tra uh, they try and trans differentiate into type one cells, but get stuck and have features which are consistent with both type one and type two epithelial cells and with some uh, stem cell characteristics as well, but they never trans differentiate into type one cells. You have a fibronectin rich matrix, you have an influx of fibroblasts, and importantly, you have destruction and obliteration of the basement membrane. Uh, and we've got some interesting data showing that collagen 4, which is a key component of uh, uh, of the basement membrane is, is uh, crucially defective in IPF. You also get uh, in, inflammation within the alveolus. So you have activated macrophages, you have neutrophils and lymphocytes and apoptotic epithelial cells. And this is what we see in fibrosis and it's very difficult uh, for, for, for people to breathe through this. And over the last 20 odd years now, like this, this, my group has worked on developing or understanding the molecular mechanisms which lead to the development of, of fibrosis following injury. And this, sadly, this one slide summarizes a lifetime's work. Uh, and what it shows is that mediators such as LPA2 and PAR1 will agonize G protein coupled receptors. Uh, and then send a signal through the GR4Q11 signaling pathway through row A and row kinase to the actin cytoskeleton, which is uh, bound to the cytoplasmic domain of the alpha eb 6 integrin, which itself is constitutively bound to the latent uh, TGF-beta complex. And then when the epithelial cell is injured, there's a tug on the cytoplasmic domain, a physical tug, which leads to a uh, alteration in the extracellular structure of this complex, which releases the active TGF-beta molecule from the, the latent complex to interact with the receptor on its uh, neighboring cells. And this pathway, this homeostatic pathway, can be disrupted in a number of ways. It can be disrupted if there is increased activity of the, the GQ11 row A row kinase pathway. And one of the key uh, Key checkpoint is ACAP13 because that's a ROGEF which mediates this signal. And as I said earlier, the ACAP13 mutation has been found to be causal for IPF. And the ACAP13 mutation leads to increased ACAP13 within lung cells and increased activity and increased row A. So it amplifies the signal. So if you have an ACAP13 mutation and epithelial damage, you're going to drive more row A, more row kinase activity and more alpha VB to 6 tgf beta activation, therefore more scarring. Similarly, this pathway can also be activated by TLR3 and flu virus. And we haven't got the information on COVID yet, but you can see that there are, there are many ways that you can activate rogue kinase, and that's going to have a bad effect on scarring. So what about COVID? Um, so COVID-19, I don't need to tell you, is caused by the SARS-CoV-2 infection. There are a number of different mutants, and I will talk about some of them later. At the last count, there were over 200 million cases worldwide, 400 million deaths worldwide. And certainly pre-Omicron, pre-vaccination, we were looking at an 8% hospitalization rate. Again, when I updated the UK records from yesterday, 750,000 people had been admitted with COVID-19. And thanks to vaccination in large part, possibly slight reduced pathogenicity of Omicron, we're now at 600,000 discharges. So that's 600,000 people who are discharged with COVID-19. And the risk factors for increased severity of COVID-19 are eerily familiar. So increasing age, male sex, and the comorbidities of hypertension, type two diabetes, and ischemic heart disease. So the things that put you at increased risk for pulmonary fibrosis, put you at increased risk for COVID-19 severity. So that got me thinking years ago now, two years ago, what, what was the link between the epithelial injury in the, uh, in the alveolus 
and, uh, and COVID. Well, the, the first thing that everyone thought of, not surprisingly, was ACE2 gene expression. But if you look here, the amount of ACE2 actually expressed on 82 cells and 81 cells is vanishingly low. 1.5% of 82 cells, which are the predominant cell um, that, that is infected by the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus in the lung, express ACE2. So it can't be that simple. And when we looked at uh, epithelial cells in culture, we found a, a similar uh, a, a similar thing that there's very little ACE2 in lung epithelial cells, A549 cells or small airway epithelial cells and IH backs, very little ACE2 in comparison with the workhorse cell, the human embryonic kidney cell. Uh, and this is both at message and protein level, a bit more in the bronchi. So that got me thinking, what, what could it be about the al alveolus which which facilitates uh, cell entry if there's only 1.5% of type two cells and less than 1% of type one cells expressing the ACE2 uh, uh, receptor. And so we looked at the SARS-CoV uh, spike protein and particularly at the receptor binding domain, which binds ACE2. And this got me very excited because in the middle of the uh, receptor binding domain is an RGD motif and an RGD motif uh, is what binds integrins, RGD binding integrins, such as the alpha B beta 6 integrin. That's how it binds latent T to beta uh, protein through the RGD domain. So in theory, at least, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, spike protein can bind uh, integrins. But what's interesting about the RGD domain, so it's this little red thing here, is that it's a cryptic RGD domain, which means that in the unbound, in native form, proteins can't see it. So RGD binding proteins can't see the RGD binding domain because it's hidden within the three-dimensional structure of spike protein. However, when SARS-CoV-2 binds the ACE2 receptor, it reveals the RGD domain, meaning that at that point, it can bind uh, RGD binding proteins such as integrins. And indeed, what we what we looked what we saw when we looked at post mortem samples from patients who died of COVID in, in wave one, what we saw was very interesting. So this is uh, this is RNA scope for ACE two, and you should see a blue color. So this is the renal epithelium, which is full of ACE two, uh, and you can see very nicely the blue staining here. But this section of lung has very little ACE two, and yet in a parallel section, there's a lot of RNA, a viral RNA measured by uh, RNA scope in the parallel section. There's also a lot of alpha V beta 6. And, and you can see that in the parenchyma here. So there's a lot of co association between viral RNA and beta 6 in the lung, but very little uh, between ACE2 and viral RNA, suggesting there must be an alternative mechanism for viral entry. And when we looked at the amount of uh, beta-6 that we observed in COVID-19 lung, we saw it was very similar uh, to, to what was observed in IPF. So a bit like uh, uh, it goes up, basically. So in, in, in COVID-19, you get increased expression of alpha beta-6, as we see in IPF. So we did some simple adhesion assays, some solid phase adhesion assays. This was well done by Jess Calver and the group. And as you can see, with, there is a nice dose dependent increase in ACE2 binding to spike protein, which is not a surprise because it's the cognate receptor. But what you'll also see is that there is a, a dose dependent increase in alpha VB to 3 and alpha VB to 6 binding to spike protein. And both of these are RGD binding proteins. And this is uh, blocked by the addition of EDTA, which prevents RGD binding. It collates the, uh, the, 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 the magnesium that's required for RGD binding. And so what, what this shows is that spike protein binding to alpha VB to 6 and alpha VB to 3 is both possible and RGD dependent. So in collaboration with Tom Peacock uh, in Wendy Barclay's lab, we did some pseudovirus experiments. 
And so we took cells which didn't express any ACE2, alpha e beta 3 or alpha e beta 6, and we overexpressed the individual receptors. So we overexpressed ACE2, the beta 3 subunit and the beta 6 subunit, and the, the alpha V subunit is, is ubiquitous in all cells. And then we, uh, we infected them with the pseudovirus and measured uh, luciferase. And what you can see is that if you express ACE2 on its own, that is sufficient to, uh, to generate cell entry for both SARS-CoV-1, which has a KGD domain, and SARS-CoV-2, which has an RGD domain. And both of these will bind integrins. However, if you overexpress the integrins on their own, you do not get cell entry uh, of the pseudovirus. So it's not sufficient to have just the integrin, presumably because the cryptic domain for the pseudovirus doesn't allow entry. But if you co-express ACE2 and the beta-3 and beta-6 integrins, you, you get increased uh, viral entry into, into cells, suggesting that the integrins augment uh, viral entry into epithelial cells. And we see this also here using this immunocytochemistry. So we stained uh, cells for the integrin and spike here. So integrin in green and spike in blue, uh, and integrins in green and ACE2 in red, and ACE here in red and spike in blue. And so purple, apologies, purple is co-expression of spike and ACE2, yellow is co-expression of green and red. Uh, and of course, uh, the light blue here is the, is, is the, uh, the celeste, is the co-expression of, of green and blue. And what you can see is that you only get binding of, sorry, I don't know, the, the computer's decided to move ahead on its own. But you only get co-expression of, uh, of the spike and the integrin where you also get ACE2. So we think this is the, the reason for amplification is that you, you get binding of spike to the ACE2 and it then facilitates binding to the integrin. Now, and we see that there is increased ACE2 expression and increased B6 expression in the lungs of patients with IPF. And we see particularly in the small airways, increase in ACE2 expression. So in people with increased ACE2 expression and increased beta-6 expression, you might expect outcomes to be worse. And indeed, this is what we found uh, at the end of wave one uh, for patients who were admitted to hospital with interstitial lung disease, that they had more severe outcomes if they got admitted with COVID-19. So, Patients with IPF had a, almost a twofold increased risk of mortality compared to patients with that ILD, and patients with non fibrotic ILD were somewhere in between. The risk factors included being obese so, and, and also having worse lung function. So, if you had an FBC of less than 80% predicted on admission uh, or the last recorded measurement before admission uh, to, to, to hospital with COVID, you had a twofold increased risk almost of, of death. And if you were an elderly male uh, in this audit, uh, over 65 with IPF, you had a 67% chance of dying of your COVID. I mean, the, the risk to this patient group was eye-watering. So just a few bits now about Omicron. So this is a, a recent paper published in, in Nature last month and it does suggest that patients with or that omicron uh, is less efficient at affecting at infecting epithelial cells you can see here that compared with delta and wild type you get less virus replication in lung epithelial cells uh, and this is done using lung slice experiments um, than you do with delta or wild type and then when you look at viral proteins Again, you can see here that there is some viral protein in the parenchyma, but much less compared to wild type. So why is this? 
Well, it's not going to be due to the ACE2 because the levels of ACE2 expression are the same, whether you're infected with Omicron or Delta. But what is interesting is that Omicron, Delta and wild type have different tropism for co-receptors. So whereas the wild type and Delta require Tempras 2, which is expressed in 40% of alveolar type 1 and type 2 cells, the, uh, the, the, the Omicron virus uses uh, cathepsin L. And you can see here, it's much lower. So that, that's, that's actually 20%, but it's about 3% of 81 uh, cells and less than 1% of 82 cells actually express cathepsin L. So maybe the, uh, the co-receptors are more important at determining whether or not you get viral replication and alveolar damage than the primary ACE2 receptor. So will COVID-19 lead to pulmonary fibrosis? This is the question that everyone is interested in and everyone is arguing about. Uh, and it will be interesting to hear what the, uh, the intensive care physicians on the call think about this as we move forward. We know that COVID can cause fibrosis. These are a, a, an exquisite series of CT scans. Patient before getting COVID, and you can see beautifully normal lungs with a, with a good apical to diaphragmatic diameter of 23 centimeters nearly. After three weeks, at the height of the acute lung injury, you see a lot of ground glass, reduced apical to, to diaphragmatic diameter, and some traction change consistent with early fibrosis. By six weeks, the traction change is marked, the ground glass shadowing is largely gone, and you are left with reticulation, suggestive of fibrosis. But this is acute fibrosis, and it's not the same necessarily as idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or progressive long-term fibrosis. So we got funding from the UKRI to, to try and understand this. Uh, and we, we're doing the UK Institute of Lung Disease Consortium COVID, uh, Long COVID-19 study. Uh, and this rather sad looking consort diagram pretty much illustrates the problems that we have. So of the initial FOSP uh, COVID study cohort that we were able to ana analyze, and this, this uh, is a collaboration with FOSP COVID, we had 6,135 patients discharged from hospital. However, we lost two and a half thousand of those because they had incomplete early follow-up. This will change. But that gave us 3,728 patients who we had follow-up less than 240 days. We lost 26 of those because they had pre-existing interstitial lung disease to give us our final ILD interim cohort. Of those, 1,280 didn't have a complete research visit. We are optimistic that those data will be entered, but that gave us 2,422 patients who had a research visit uh, recorded. And of those, 2,095 had not had a CT scan. And this is the problem. So 240 had a CT scan, but we didn't know what it showed. And OT, only 87 uh, had a CT scan with data that we could analyze. And of those, 10 had had two CTs. So the consort diagram shows you how you can go in a prospective clinical trial from 6,135 to 10. And missing data is a huge problem. Uh, and you can see here the number of people in the fast COVID study who at the interim analysis, and we expect this will change, who had got missing data in the following key indices uh, for determining whether or not someone might have fibrosis. So gas transfer, FBC, chest x-ray, and symptoms. And this is pretty much what we were doing clinic. We would ask them how they felt, measure their lung function, and do a chest x-ray, and then decide whether or not they needed a CT scan. So what Ian did in this uh, sort of Herculean effort was to try and come up with an algorithm which would predict using clinical observations who might have interstitial lung damage, which is what we call the immediate post-COVID effect, because we don't know 
whether this is going to resolve or progress. So we didn't think that it would be appropriate to call it an, an interstitial lung disease. But because we didn't know what the future holds, we still don't know what the future holds, uh, we, we reported it as damaged because there was clear evidence of damage. And so we took the, the 74 scans with evidence of damage and, and saw what the risk factors uh, promoting this damage would be in the, the ones which we had a score. In there. And so being a male uh, and having a severe disease requiring CPAP or invasive mechanical ventilation, having an abnormal chest X-ray or having a reduced gas transfer were highly predictive of having interstitial lung damage on your CT scan. So we went, then went and looked at those patients who had had a CT, but hadn't been scored yet. So we assumed that because CTs were being done for clinical purposes and not for research purposes, we assumed that these patients had had a CT scan because someone had thought they might have an abnormality on them. And we found largely the same risk factors. So your risk of being referred for CT was increased if you had severe disease, so CPAP uh, and invasive mechanical ventilation, increased if you had an abnormal chest x-ray, and increased if you had an abnormal gas transfer of less than 80%. So we came up with this, this uh, risk algorithm of interstitial lung damage, which we could then apply to the whole cohort who hadn't yet had a CT scan. Uh, and so if patients had all three diagnostic indicators, so an abnormal chest X-ray, reduced gas transfer, and a severe admission, they were at very high risk of having had, of having interstitial lung damage. If they had two of these indicators present, they were at high risk, and one indicator, moderate risk. And so on that basis, we were able to estimate that about 8% of patients discharged from hospital would have some evidence of interstitial lung damage. And if you apply that to the whole cohort or the whole population, that's a huge number of people who have interstitial lung damage at three months. What happens to these people going forward, we still don't know, but that will be the... Uh, the, one of the primary endpoints of the, the final analysis. But when we looked at the 10 patients who'd had repeat CT scans, what we see is quite stark. And that is contrary to what everyone believes. And this is, this is a real problem. We have to overcome people's belief systems here. The patients, when they have their repeat CT scans, are not obviously getting better. Some are. You know, there's a couple here that you can see that the, 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 the CT uh, percentage of CT damage as assessed by a respiratory radiologist is getting better, but the vast majority uh, seem to be staying the same. They're not getting worse, but they're not getting better. And, and for me, I don't think that's a victory uh, if your CT scan's not worsening. It, it, it might be regarded as a benefit if you have IPF, but at this you know, some of these people might be very young and they may have permanent lung damage. And these data are largely consistent with what we found when we did a systematic review of patients uh, who'd had imaging and lung function post-COVID. Uh, and what we find is that in terms of spirometry, so reduced FVC, patients don't have, or well, people don't have much of a reduction in their spirometry, less than 25% of patients at immediately following discharge and at up to six months have a reduced FVC. In contrast, a reduced gas transfer is very common. Almost 50% uh, of patients, over 50% immediately, and then at six months, 45% of people will still have a reduced gas transfer. There must be an explanation for this reduced gas transfer, and interstitial lung damage is likely to be a substantial part of that. When we looked at the CTs, and again, these are people, people don't have CTs for no reason. Uh, so there's a lot of bias in these data, but if you look at the inflammation in a CT uh, at baseline, there's obviously a lot of inflammation. It was almost pathognomic in the early days of diagnosing COVID, uh, 
And then over time, over six months, the, the inflammation slowly resolves. However, if fibrosis was found at baseline CT, it didn't shift. And almost 30% of patients uh, who had a CT had evidence of fibrosis up to six months. So there's likely in a select group of patients to be a lot of persistent fibrosis. The problem is we're not investigating anywhere near enough, partly because we, there, is a, there is the perception within the community that it's all gonna get better. And yet 60% of patients are still complaining of breathlessness. So something's not getting better and we're not doing the lung function and we're not doing the CT scans on them. It's a bit like not testing for COVID. You won't know you've got a problem unless you measure it. So are there any reasons why patients with COVID might be at risk of progressive fibrosis? Well, I mentioned that one of the causal genetic risk factors that we'd identified for IPF was DPP9. And you can see here from uh, Kenny Bailey's original Nature paper that DPP9 is a causal variant for severe COVID. Similarly, and I, I, I gather this has also been published in Nature, that um, the ATP11A polymorphism, which is another causal variant for, for IPF, is also a causal variant for severe COVID-19. So there's genetic links to alveolar damage and progressive fibrosis. But interestingly, MUC5B, the most severe, important, major risk factor, genetic risk factor for IPF, is actually protective against severe COVID-19. And this is work that we published uh, a, a year ago now, uh, but it's been re replicated by a number of different groups. And what it shows is that if you have the minor allele, so the risk allele for IPF, you're actually protected from symptomatic COVID uh, you're versus uh, to having COVID versus not having COVID. You, you have a lower risk of hospitalization if you get COVID, and you're a much lower risk of ending up on a ventilator if you have COVID, if you have MUC5B, the risk allele. So this made no sense to us. Why? How can it be that we know that if you're admitted with COVID and IPF, your risk of dying is much higher. But if you have the major genetic risk factor for IPF, your risk of dying is much lower. So we did something called a leave one out analysis. It's great because it does exactly what it says on the tin, which is we took all the causal risk factors and looked at their risk of severe COVID if you had all risk factors, or sorry, all genetic polymorphisms, the, the, the 16 that we knew about at the time, but you left out the one that's listed on the y-axis. And what you can see is that for the vast majority of uh, genes with IPF, for, sorry, causal for IPF, there's a, 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 a marginal trend towards increased risk of severe COVID, but it crosses the line of unity. So there's no change until you leave this allele out. And this is the MUC5B allele, which means that all other genetic risk factors for pulmonary fibrosis substantially increase your risk of severe COVID, with the exception of MUC5B, which reduces your risk. So if you look at them all together, there is no apparent increased risk. So it's possible that patients who have pulmonary fibrosis not due to MUC5B have worse outcomes. So what can we learn from a positive effect from COVID-19 uh, and, and how that might relate to pulmonary fibrosis? Well, I'm not gonna suggest that dexamethasone is gonna be a good treatment for pulmonary fibrosis, but what the recovery trial showed us was that platform trials are very effective. And clearly you can see that you know, dexamethasone was the first, uh, first intervention, which was proved to reduce uh, mortality. Uh, and ventilation in COVID and uh, great fanfare and great excitement. Uh, and subsequently, uh, Tony Gordon and others for the BREMAT cap, uh, as well as recovery, showed that tocilizumab had a similar effect, improving survival. In fact, all interleukin-6 uh, antagonists had, had some benefit, if, if anything, sorry, 
was even better than top of this map. And, and similarly, there was so much of this data that we were able to publish a systematic review at pretty much the same time as remap cap and recovery, which showed exactly the same uh, survival benefit. So platform trials work and IR6 works acutely, anti-IR6 works acutely. But what's this gonna mean for pulmonary fibrosis? Well, we don't know. Uh, and it shows that you have to do trials. But IL-6 is a funny molecule, and these are data from, uh, from, from, from the bleomycin model, and they show something very interesting, and that's if you give IL-6 after the inflammatory, sorry, if you give anti-IL-6 after the inflammatory phase of, uh, of the bleomycin injury, you can reduce uh, fibrosis and reduce adverse outcomes in mice uh, by giving tocilizumab or or an anti-R6. However, if you give it during the inflammatory phase, you might actually make the fibrosis worse, certainly acutely. Uh, and so understanding the role of these things in longer term outcomes remains to be determined. And that's where other studies are required. So platform trials for long COVID, post COVID and IPF are required. So that's very much why I got involved with Heal COVID uh, with, with Charlotte and Mark's application and for this excellent study, because just because something works acutely as it does in recovery or remap cap, it doesn't mean it's gonna have similar long-term effects. And we really need to understand the longer term consequences of COVID and ultimately we really need to do this for ILD. Uh, and so one of, I, hopefully one of the major plus points for COVID in the RD community is a platform trial for ILD. And we're working at trying to understand whether remapping ILD will be feasible. Uh, and there's certainly a lot of excitement. And Charlotte, Mark, Tony Gordon, and Roger Lewis, who is a PI for Remap Cap, who are instrumental in COVID platform trials, are working with us to try and uh, see if we can launch Remap RD. And they will be leading uh, a workshop on the 3rd of May. If you wish to sign up, do so quickly because we've already had a large number of people sign up. And if you contact Natasha, she will be able to provide you with the link. So I'm just going to finish there and say that. Uh, IPF results from an abnormal response to alveolar injury, and without a shadow of a doubt, COVID-19 is the major cause of alveolar injury at the current time. There are shared biological and genetic mechanisms between IPF and severe COVID-19, and COVID-19 does lead to considerable interstitial lung damage. However, we are hopeful that this will be lower with Omicron, but still with 600,000 people being discharged from hospital with COVID, the potential for persisting or worse still progressing interstitial lung disease is substantial, especially when we consider the latent period for this is about 20 years. Platform trials, however, are a very efficient way to answer multiple therapeutic questions and therefore, we are trying to launch a platform trial in ILD. So I will stop uh, when having thanked the guys who did all this work, my previous uh, group in, in London and those who, sorry, in Nottingham and those who came with me to London. So thank you, and I'll take any questions.